talent, talent, talent. It's the number one, the number two, and the number three challenge for middle market companies. We'll learn about how one chamber of commerce is making a difference for those companies and their search for skills on the next episode of The Market That Moves America. Welcome to The Market That Moves America, a podcast from the National Center for the Middle Market, which will educate you about the challenges facing mid-sized companies and help you take advantage of new opportunities. Unemployment is near record lows. Companies, particularly middle market companies, are struggling to find the talent they need with the skills they need. In today's podcast, we'll hear how one metropolitan area is addressing the problem. I'm Tom Stewart. I'm the executive director of the National Center for the Middle Market at the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business. We're the nation's leading research group studying the mid-sized companies that account for a third of private sector employment and GDP and the lion's share of economic growth. We call it the market that moves America. The National Center for the Middle Market is a partnership between Ohio State, Chubb, Grant Thornton LLP, and Cisco Systems. I have two special guests with me today. Wendy Grams, who is the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Toledo, Ohio, and Brian Dicken, who is in charge of policy for the Chamber. Wendy, Brian, welcome to the market that moves America. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Tom. Um, Toledo is, as you all know, in the upper left-hand corner of Ohio, and Toledo is the center of a metropolitan area of about 650,000 people. It's long been a manufacturing town, and it still is. I mean, Wendy, tell us a little bit about, you know, the, your members, about the, about the businesses in Toledo and the business of Toledo. Sure, great. Be happy to. Um, you mentioned manufacturing, and that is um, a part of our rich history and also a part of um, current day and a part of our future, and that's something that um, we've really embraced. Um, the tagline to our, our economic development strategy is that it matters where you make it um, because we do still make things here. It also has a dual meaning of this is a great place um, to make a life for yourself and a, and a career. Um, situated, um, obviously, in the, in the great state of Ohio, um, just uh, south of Detroit, um, Michigan, you can imagine, um, but, and I know people are booing that are listening to this, but uh, uh, I'm a Buckeye, so not to worry. Um, but um, that really has, um, has us with a lot of um, tier two auto suppliers um, because of the, the big auto industry um, in Detroit. So we do have um, you know, specifically manufacturing, but then specifically a, a large concentration um, around um, auto, auto, auto industry. Um, also, because of where we're situated geographically um, in, in the um, country and in the Midwest specifically, we also have um, a lot of logistic companies. So um, that's a, kind of the, the makeup of, of our um, community. And what, what we find really is that while our economy doesn't rise quickly, um, you know, at the kind of the head of the curve um, with the country, it also doesn't fall as fast or hard either. Um, so yep. we have a, a little bit of stability, I think, that we enjoy um, in Toledo that maybe um, they don't certainly in, in other parts of the country. So Toledo is a place about making it, but also with the logistics, with the logistics component and right there on the lake, a place about moving it as, as, as well. Um, one of the things that, that when, when we think about um, mid-sized companies, one of the things that's fascinating is that manufacturing is the core of the middle market. I think the U.S. economy as a whole is about 12 or 13 percent manufacturing, but the middle market is 17 or 18 percent manufacturing. So, and so when you think per, specifically about an industry like the automotive industry writ large, people think about you know GM, Ford, and Chrysler, but actually surrounding them, supporting them, and indispensable to them are all of these mid-sized suppliers of components and parts and, and, and things like that, many of them clustered there in, in and around uh, Toledo. Right, and I think the um, thing that people forget about as well is a lot of those middle market companies that support the auto industry are very high tech. They're yeah. very innovative. Um, and so you mentioned, you know, we make things, we move things. We also um, design, um, develop, make, and move. So it's kind of that whole, um, that whole process of, you know, innovating new technologies to solve problems, 
um, putting them in the design phase, the testing, all the way through the manufacturing, and then the shipping. So that that that, that sort of leads to this whole skills question and and the workforce development question. Um, in our national figures, when we ask executives of middle market companies about their challenges, the number one challenge, number one with a bullet, is is talent. And when you double click on that talent question, you find a whole set of questions, some about the sheer availability of, of talent. I just can't find people. But a lot of it is also about talent and skills. What are your what do you see in in, 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 in and around Toledo about that about the, the talent you know, the supply and demand equation, I guess, for talent? Well, not unlike any city in Ohio or in the country, I mean, but we hear from employers all the time. And whether it's, you know, a small mom and pop restaurant, the middle market or large companies, everyone's saying the same thing. I can't find people. Um, in the manufacturing sector specifically, we hear um, when it comes to that skill set, people saying they just need to show up every day and pass a drug test. We'll teach them what they need to know. So that's the sort of anecdotal. So what we wanted to do was really dig into, you know, what are what are um, the jobs that are open? What are the skill sets associated with those jobs? What will those jobs look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? So we engaged um, and we're right in the middle of a, a really um, great process. We partnered with Avalanche Consulting and Kale, um, and they are helping us really do a deep dive talent pipeline analysis. And, and what do so you learn? Well, what we're learning for that is that there are, you know, what we think we know and what maybe was true four years, five years ago, um, you know, welders is a good example. We, we've been hearing for four or five years, we need welders, we need welders, we can't find welders. Well, guess what? We look at our educational system and we have some great universities and, and colleges here um, in, in this part of Ohio as well. And, you know, what we're finding is, well, we're graduating some welders, but they're not finding opportunities. And so um, it, it's very, it's complicated and it's organic and you really have to dig in and dig deeper and find out, well, why is that? In that particular case, we have some evidence, but we're again digging um, even deeper that um, they don't have the experience that the companies are looking for. So then we go back to those, um, those training um, institutions and say, okay, what does that mean exactly? And how can we provide some on the job um, training or experience while they're um, they're studying their craft at, at your your organization so that they are job ready. So you know, and that's just one small component. So this is a, a very big undertaking, but I'm not sure that there's anything that we could be working on a, on as a community that's more important than that. So talk to me about did talk. You mentioned three. You mentioned the that first thing you mentioned was somebody who will show up and pass a drug test, which sort of goes in that cluster of things that sometimes people call soft skills. You know, understanding what work is, showing up at work, having the work ethic, being, you know, being able to sort of work as a team. So there's that one set of soft skills. Then you mentioned welding, which is the classic, a classic industrial skill. You know, we see data, uh, I know Brookings, for example, has developed a lot of data that talk about the creation of jobs with high tech skills, which you also mentioned, and that the, the new jobs, and particularly the new good jobs, often require digital or other high tech skills. So you get this palette, right, of soft skills, classic vocational skills, let's call them, and high tech skills. How does that picture look for you, and how do you find out where the gaps are and how to close them? Well, and that's exactly why we're doing the analysis, because we don't want to go on, you know, anecdotal. We don't want to put all our resources, limited resources, into setting up a program or some sort of training um, if there's a greater need um, in, in some other area. So we're going to find that out. We're going to prioritize, and then we're going to put our resources toward um, that, that low-hanging fruit, um, you know, if it is soft skills. And I think that's something, though, that we need to go into, you know, the junior highs and the, the grade schools and probably even earlier, you can't just all of a sudden teach somebody a work ethic. You can't just all of a sudden say, you know, well, you know, get off drugs because now you, I mean, we have to make sure those things don't happen in the first place. So it really goes back and we have a lot of um, things that we're doing in that area, like our, you know, our train program, 
um, which is designed to meet the growing demand for career exploration. People aren't really being taught, um, young people aren't thinking about what do I want to do for a career, and we want to put the right kid on the right path. So what is it they're passionate about? What is it they're good at? What type of training and education will their, their family and social situation allow? And let's make sure that we've got people set up to be successful with their definition of success, not ours. You know, we found, you, you put your finger on, it, on something that we found also in, in our data, um, that particularly true for mid-sized companies, which is they don't often have the resources to do training on their own, I mean, in a substantial way. Obviously, there's on-the-job training. There is some, but to some extent, one of the things we found is that if they have a round, you know, if they, if they have a vacancy, if they have a round hole, they want a round peg. And they don't want a square peg that they can sand down to make it round because they don't really have the resources. And if you think about it, I mean, a typical company of, you know, with if you have a company with, with 250 employees, 300 employees, it's likely to have an HR team of three or four. So, so it, it doesn't really have those resources. So the need to connect to community resources is great, and yet often those community resources have a hard time knowing the smaller companies that that have this need. And you know, it's easier for them to say, "Oh, there's Owens Corning; it's a big company. Let's deal with them." And, and harder to see um, to to see the aggregate demand from twenty or thirty smaller firms. You're absolutely right, um, and and I think that it's it's twofold. There, you know, they need to plug into those resources, and those resources are there. It's just sometimes those resources are misaligned, and so the the you know you hit it. The the real um, challenge, um, although I think it's it's something that's doable, is to make sure that we're connecting. And again, it sounds like a cliche: connect business and education, right? Everybody says that, uh, but it, it is really important that. The um, resources that are available are talking to, and again, not just the big companies, but they're talking to um, the mid middle market on, okay, are we training people on, on the right things? And almost um, at some point, too, customizing some of that. Um, because if you pull a lot of uh, smaller companies together, they start to look like a big company in terms of their training needs. And that's really where we're coming in um, as the Chamber of Commerce representing 2,300 of these companies is to say, you know, there are um, a lot of similarities, you know, within different companies about what they need, especially soft skills, right? Soft skills transcend a lot of different industries. So um, we need to make sure that we put those those types of programs together. Uh, and then that's not even good enough because companies get busy, right? They say they need something, but they're busy working on their business. So we need to make sure that those resources are in front of them, known to them, and easy for them to access. And we really see that as our role. Do you know, we, we did some work in Philadelphia, and, and we're talking to somebody who represented um, a training organization and also uh, an organization that could provide government grants. I think there's some uh, DOE or other federal grants that can support certain kinds of training. And one of the things that she learned was that, that the people who took the most advantage of these programs tended to be larger companies, perhaps because they had larger teams that could figure out that these programs were there, right? And, and, and so what's interesting is it seems to me that I, I, I'm intrigued by what, what you said a minute ago. You said connect companies to, to trainers and to schools and, 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 and universities. And I was thinking, yes, but which companies and which universities? Who are the stakeholders you've got to bring in here so that You've got the universities, you've got the chamber, you've got the companies. You're really orchestrating an ecosystem. And I guess the question is, you know, who needs to be in that ecosystem? And should more chambers of commerce do the job that you're doing of being the sort of the, the, the keystone, the orchestrator of the ecosystem? You know, I think a lot of chambers are, and if they're not, they, they certainly should be. And I know that most of my counterparts in, in the larger cities um, here in Ohio are very heavily engaged um, in, in these programs. So they, they might look different, be called something different, but I think they're all, they're all pretty engaged. 
um, in this effort. And, you know, the chambers are really um, the only, one of the very few, if not the only organization that can bring together um, business, government, and citizens. And that is really what what we need to do um, when it comes to this workforce workforce challenge, right? The, the citizens are the individuals. Without them, um, you know, kind of what we're what we're doing doesn't work. We can set up, we can understand the needs, we can set up great programs, but if we don't have individuals willing and able, um, who want to work, who want to gain those skills, who who want to do um, you know do better and, and be part of the economy, it, it all falls apart. So that's um, that's sort of a new area for us is really embracing the fact that we need to bring the individuals to the table as well. Um, I think we're we're pretty good at bringing you know business um, and government together. And that's kind of the third piece that, that we didn't mention um, in this analysis that we're doing. Our, the city of Toledo and Lucas County, are they're all in. Um, they funded funding it at the same level that we are. They're at the table. Um, the staff of, of the workforce development or the WIBs, which you know, have gotten bad reputations over the years, you know, probably sometimes are and sometimes not, you know, they're all in. They want to know what is it that, you know, we, we, that we need to be training people on. We want to see people... Um, move into the economy, we, we want to be successful. And it's really turning workforce around and saying, we're not going to look at it from a supply side. Oh my gosh, we have all these people that need work. We need to look at it from the demand side. What is the what is the pipeline that's needed and how do we make sure that we, we fill that pipeline, not just in the short term, but, but in the long term. Um, so you're right, all of the parties have to come together and it's easier now because, you know, there is this sense of urgency, particularly on the parts of companies, right? They know that they can't advance their companies, they can't get orders out the door, they can't take on new business if they don't have trained people. And and, and that's like I said, from you know a, a waitress to you know a CFO and and everything in between. So um, it's a great time to bring people together because there is that sense of urgency. Yeah, our our, our numbers show that nearly four out of ten middle market executives say that a lack of talent is constraining their growth. I mean, they literally are saying, I could grow faster if I had more people or more people right. with the right, more people with, with, this, with, this, with the skills that I need. I guess that's that, that other piece of it. So as you've, you've been doing this, this train program is year old, a couple of years old. Um, and talk to me about what, what, what you've seen, what, what, you know, what's working and what's not. Uh, what you wish you'd known. One thing you mentioned, I guess, is that you wish you'd known more about the importance of bringing the individuals in. What you wish you'd known at the start that you've learned, so that and 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 where you think you are on this on on this journey. Yeah. So thanks, Tom. We we started training about three years or so, and uh, I really started off getting with the the teachers, the guidance counselors, to talk to them about how. Uh, there are opportunities that exist that may not require that college degree. Um, and it was really eye-opening, I think, as we got into it, um, that they were really in silos, and, and they didn't always see how uh, things connected. Like a great example was we had one of our uh, uh, construction firms in, and they brought in this big, glossy brochure, and the visual communications teacher was had suddenly enlightened that her students could go into construction, um, hadn't really made those connections that, um, you know, within manufacturing or construction, you still need the accountants, the logistics people, um, the graphic designers to help communicate. And so we've really been able to, I think, make some progress um, with the students as well as, as we have brought business leaders in and talked about the opportunities. And I think the biggest thing that we've seen is that we still need a lot of people, but the nature of the work is changing. So if you, you know, you go back 30 years or so ago and, um, you know, robotics were becoming bigger parts of manufacturing and people thought everybody was going to get, lose their job to, to a robot. Really what we've seen is we've got more people than ever working. Uh, but now we need people who can troubleshoot and maintain those robots, not just, you know, install that widget. So, trying to help change perceptions about what manufacturing looks like today compared to 20 or 30 years ago has been a big part of, of what we've been able to do. 
And Tom, I think the other thing too is that um, we, what we have found is um, a lot of people, they might hear about, you know, Dana or Owens Corning or OI, but they have no idea really what they do. And you don't have people sitting in middle school or junior high thinking, wow, I, I could work there someday. And that's what we need to change is, is people really having an understanding of, um, and, and again, not just those large companies, but also the, the middle market companies that, you know, whatever, whether I want to be a graphic designer, a CFO or whatever, there are companies here, you know, in Toledo, I don't have to leave my state. I don't even have to leave my, my city um, to have a, a great career. And that's the other message that we, we need to send to, to people. Figure out your career and then hopefully we encourage them um, to start and grow their careers right here in the Toledo region. Yeah, one of the things I realize, and you think about people, people talk about the you know, the lack of talent and the heart, but the difficulty they have finding talent. That's not true at Google, right? I mean, they may, you know, they, they get, they're getting 30 resumes at every nanosecond there, and it's part because it is such a famous company, and famous companies have an easier time of it than those that may be local champions, not as well known, but as you said, they need you know, serious analytics skills. They need great design skills. And, and, and sort of projecting that, I guess, that employer brand along with the regional brand, right? So here are some great places to work, great opportunities. And by the way, in a community that you know and love, uh, it's that there, there really is a, a, a branding effort that helps attract the talent you need. And as you said, people forget that a construction company needs more than people who can carry I-beams around. Right. And, you know, besides, so again, we have a kind of a two-prong approach when it comes to um, attracting talent, right? So we want to keep the talent we have, but we also, you know, need to, to attract talent because not everybody's going to stay. And that, so it's a two-fold marketing campaign. First, you have to market the region. Right. They have to think and see themselves living and working in this region or it doesn't matter what your company does. They're not interested. And then the company that also has to um, make sure that they, they tell their story um, and their story better include how they're involved in the community and how they're involved in important social issues. Because, you know, millennials especially, they want to work for a company that, you know, besides, um, you know, building buildings or, uh, you know, making cars is also making a difference in the community. And so when we talk to middle market companies about, you know, why it's important for them to be involved in the community, you know, it's not because, well, these are where your customers are. It's because this is what your employees are going to demand from you. They're going to want to see that you're involved, um, you know, in, in some way preferably in the local community where they're going to live and work. So um, there's been a little bit of, of retraining and retooling of a lot of the, the recruiters as well that um, you better be able to sell the region that you're, that you're in that people are going to be expected to live in in a positive way or telling your company story isn't going to matter. Do you know, I think you've just summarized, some, some, some summarized this conversation and also the issue extraordinarily well, which, which is – sort of you're not on your own. And, and, and that means in two senses of the word. Uh, a company is not on its own. There are resources around that can amplify its brand, that can support it, that it can call on. Many of them, like the Toledo Chamber, are actively engaged and actively engaged with hard data and not just anecdotes. So you're not on your own in, in that sense, which is there is support out there, go and find it. But the other thing is you're not on your own in the sense that you can't do it alone. You, 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 you know, not only are those resources available to you but, you, but you need those resources to make the pitch to employees, and I guess the same message would go for a, a community, right, for the, uh, the business development office, and the same message would go for an individual. You're not on your own you, in both ways. There is support, and you can't do it alone. Right. Our message to you know, our middle market members are um, when you're out there looking for talent and trying to attract talent, you recruit them to your company, and we will recruit them to the region. Yep. 
Yeah. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Wendy, um, Wendy Grams and, and Brian Dickin from the Toledo Chamber of Commerce. We invited them onto the market that moves America because when I was up in Toledo recently giving a talk that the, 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 the workforce development program, they call it TRAIN, uh, that they've described to you struck me as being one of the most comprehensive and sophisticated uh, that I've seen and something worth learning from uh, in other metropolitan areas, but also worth, worth, worth learning about for mid-sized businesses and the people that support them anywhere. You can learn a lot more about Toledo's Workforce Initiative at their website, which is www.toledochamber.com and then slash workforce hyphen development, but just go to the toledochamber.com website and you can learn more about that. And, and so, Wendy, Brian, thank you very much for, for coming on the podcast today. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to The Market That Moves America. Never miss a new episode. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Or you can subscribe and learn more about us at our website, and that website is middlemarketcenter.org. Thanks very much. 